Baptist here at Twin City Bible Church. We come and in our first musical worship song are going to express the reality of our dependence upon our good God, the one from whom all blessings flow. And yet we also recognize that our hearts, because we still carry with us our sinful nature, our hearts are prone to wander from this God that we claim to love. But then we're reminded that we continue to cling to our hope and cling to Christ, not because of anything within us, but we cling to Christ because Christ clings to us. So let's stand together, pray this opening musical prayer of dependence. Come thou fount of every blessing. Just me. 
Please remain standing as we hear from our God through the reading of his word. One of our elders, Mike Riles, will come and lead us in reading the scriptures and in prayer this morning. 71 this morning. Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of habitation to which I may continually come. You have given commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the grasp of the wrongdoer and ruthless man, for you are my hope. O Lord God, you are my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually of you. I have become a marvel to many, for you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all day long. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies have spoken against me, and those who watch for my life have consulted together, saying, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there is none, no one to deliver. O God, do not be far from me. O my God, hasten to my help. 
Let those who are adversaries of my soul be ashamed and consumed. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek to injure me. But as for me, I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all day long, for I do not know the sum of them. I will come with the mighty deeds of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, you have taught me from my youth, and I still declare your wondrous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, O God, do not forsake me, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to all who are to come. For your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You who have shown me many troubles and distresses will revive me again and will bring me up again from the depths of the earth. May you increase my greatness and turn to comfort me. I will also praise you with a harp, even your truth, O my God. To you I will sing praises with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, and my soul which you have redeemed. My tongue also will utter your righteousness all day long, for they are ashamed, for they are humiliated who seek my hurt. Be seated as I pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are grateful again to be here gathered together for the sake of being taught by your word, for being instructed in the ways of righteousness. We ask, Lord, that your word would wash over us and consume our thoughts. Lord, that we would put out of our minds all of the distresses of this present day. Lord, that you would be the focus and intentions of all that we say and do this day. We ask, Lord, that you would help as your word is preached. Help us to hear. Help Jay to preach. Let your words conform us to the image of Christ for your glory. And Father, we pray that even as many of us have gathered this week with family and friends for the sake of thanksgiving, Father, we know there are so many who do not know who to thank even for their daily needs being met. But Lord, we know and we understand that there are so many that we love and care for in our families and in our friends who we see at this time of year who do not know you. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us a boldness to speak to them in love and truth. Give us words to say. Give them willing hearts to hear. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to you in all things. Lord, that we would have the boldness for this. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would help those who we have sent out, those who we support, missionaries in foreign lands. We pray for the Glass family in their ministry in Geneva, that you would just uh, continue to work through them to preach the word. We ask also for the Brown family serving in Johannesburg, South Africa, that you would help him in his efforts there teaching in the seminary and leading people there and doing the biblical language work there we just ask that you would continue to allow your word to have its proper place in the hearts of your people lord let us not forget your benefits how thankful we should be we love you and we ask all these things in christ's name amen now in prayer through our final song before the sermon this morning. It's a, another prayer of dependence. Asking the Lord to break up the hard and stony grounds of our hearts so that as the word is preached and its seed is cast in our hearts that it would grow and bear much fruit. Stand together. Just pray this song. Show us Christ.
Father, may the heart posture that we just prayed, recognizing our complete need for you and your word, would that characterize us now as we listen to the preaching of your word? And would the end of the preaching of your word that we just asked for, your glory and the confession on every tongue that Christ is Lord, would you be pleased even to answer that request this morning as our brother Jay comes to open the word for us? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Our pastors, Carrie, Danny, and Kevin are out of town today, taking the time to have some extended time with family, so I have the opportunity to fill in this morning. And I told the first hour, I'm going to jump right in because we have a large passage to work our way through. Our text this morning is Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. And some of you may remember that sometime last year I taught on the first four verses of this chapter, verses 1 through 4. This morning, I want us to go back to this text But today, I want to finish this passage, which runs all the way down through verse 13. So I'm going to spend some time in verses 1 through 4 to somewhat summarize the part 1 sermon from last year, and then we'll spend most of our time today in verses 5 to 13. And I realize it's a bit different to teach part 2 of a sermon so many months after part 1, But bear with me because I I want you to see what I believe is a very, very helpful and encouraging passage on prayer. Here at Twin City Bible Church, we affirm that faithful prayer is essential to the Christian life. We affirm that fervent, believing prayer is at the very heart of all personal growth and godliness. And we also affirm that the neglect of prayer can only lead to spiritual ruin. Yet we also understand that many Christians struggle 
in their prayer life. Many Christians realize that their prayer life is not what it should be. They desire to know more about prayer. They desire to know how to pray as they should. I would even venture to say that nearly everyone here this morning would say that he or she desires to grow in their prayer life. I certainly do. This passage speaks to that. This passage helps with that. So if you haven't already, please turn with me to Luke chapter 11 and follow along with me. And to begin with, I'm, gonna, I'm going to read just down through verse 4, and then we'll read the rest of this passage as we move through, through the text. Luke 11, verse 1. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. So in, in verse 1, Luke tells us that one of his disciples made the very request of Jesus that probably many of us would have requested had we been there with Christ. Lord, teach us to pray. And this is very helpful because Jesus responds with three critical instructions in this passage about prayer. And that will be our outline this morning. Three critical instructions to guide your prayer life. And the first critical instruction our Lord gives us is this. He gives us a pattern for prayer. This is what we looked in at, at several months ago in part one of this. But I, I want to review this with you, and then, then if you're interested, you can listen to that sermon from last year and, and to help fill, fill in more of the details. But this prayer, which Luke records in verses 2 through 4, of course, is commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer, even though many have noted that the better title would be the Disciples' Prayer. But this is critical for you to understand. In this prayer... Our Lord has given us a pattern for prayer. Our Lord here is laying forth key principles which are to guide the way we pray. Jesus is not saying to pray in these exact words. In fact, in the parallel passage in Matthew 6, on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus also taught the disciples this prayer, he tells them to pray in this way. So it's fine to say this prayer, but it's not a prayer in itself so much as it is an outline to guide our prayers. John MacArthur put it this way, the Lord's prayer is not so much a prayer in itself as it is a skeleton which believers are to flesh out with their own words of praise, adoration, petitions, and so on. It's not a substitute for our prayers, but it's a guide for them. And included in this pattern for prayer that Jesus gives us are then five essential principles, five essential principles to guide our prayers. I'll give you the first principle in just a moment, but it's important to notice, first of all, how Jesus tell us, tells us to begin our prayers. Verse 2 and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. Stop right there for a minute. Jesus tells us we are to start our prayers by addressing God as our Father. So right away, Jesus makes it clear that to pray this prayer, you must be a Christian. To, to call God Father presupposes that the one who is praying is a true follower of Christ. Only Christians saved by grace through faith in Christ have the relationship 
to God, whereby as adopted children they can call God Father. But for Christians, Jesus tells us the very first thing to pray rightly is this. You must realize that the God to whom you pray is your Father. And you're not just to say Father without thinking about what you're saying. When you pray to your Father, you should reflect on the reality that you are his redeemed, adopted, forgiven child who has been justified by faith in Christ. There's now no condemnation for you because you are in Christ Jesus. And when you pray, Jesus tells us here, you're to start with that realization. And as our Father, you realize he's fully committed to your provision and your protection. Okay, so here we go. Jesus gives us a pattern for prayer. And in this pattern for prayer in, in verses 2 through 4, he also gives us five principles for prayer. And here's the first principle to guide our prayers. The glory of God is to be the supreme priority for prayer. The glory of God is to be the supreme priority of your prayers. Verse 2, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. That word hallow means to sanctify, to make holy, or to consider something as set apart and holy. In other words, we are to pray that God would be revered that he would receive surpassing glory, honor, and praise in our own life, in our church, and throughout the world. You come looking at the sin and indifference of the unbelieving world toward God, and you say in your prayer, Father, this is not right. Cause the world to give you the praise and reverence and glory that you deserve. Or perhaps, even as a Christian, you look at your own spiritual dullness at times and you pray, Father, I need to grow in Christlikeness. Help me so that your name is hallowed in every aspect of my life. Jesus calls you at the outset of this pattern of prayer as your ultimate priority in every prayer that you pray to pray with God's glory. Do you see this? Beginning our prayers like this resets our minds and refocuses our hearts onto that which is to be our ultimate goal. A.W. Pink wrote this regarding this first petition. He said, this petition must take the precedence because the glory of God's great name is the ultimate end of all things. Every other request must not only be subordinated to this one, but must be in harmony with and in pursuance of it. We cannot pray rightly unless the honor of God is dominant in our hearts. That's so true. Here's the second essential principle that Jesus gives us in this pattern for our prayer, and this overlaps the first principle. We are to pray for the coming of God's kingdom. Jesus goes on there at the end of verse 2. We are to pray, your kingdom come. Now, God is the king of the whole universe. Nothing is outside of his ultimate control. This is sometimes referred to by theologians as his universal kingdom. But here, Jesus commands us to pray, your kingdom come. This prayer then is about the earthly kingdom. There, there's another kingdom in this present world, the kingdom of darkness. But scripture is clear that Satan's opposition is not permanent. The day will come when Satan is once and all crushed under the feet of Christ. Jesus is coming back and he's going to reign. 
He's going to turn this world into his own glorious kingdom. And Jesus here tells us that we should pray for this. Father, your kingdom come. When you pray this prayer, you're praying in effect, God, I'm not comfortable in this sinful world. This is not my home. And I long for the day when righteousness reigns. Come, Lord Jesus. And again, do you, do you see, do you begin to see how this elevates your prayers to where they should be? Praying for God's glory and praying for God's kingdom takes our focus off temporal, worldly matters and turns our focus to matters of eternal consequence. Now, we come to verse 3. And so we come to the petitions for our needs. But even with these petitions, our prayers are not God's, not man-centered, but they remain God-centered. Here's the third principle that Jesus gives us in this pattern for our prayers. Third principle, we are to pray for God's daily provision of our physical needs. We are to pray for God's daily provision of our physical needs. Verse 3 Give us each day our daily bread. Bread here is just a, a shorthand term, a shorthand way to, re, that, to say, to refer to all the necessities of our life. And notice he uses the word bread. He doesn't tell us to pray for luxuries. We're to pray for the simple necessities that allow us to live and serve the Lord, not for things that would distract us from his glory and from his kingdom. Notice also that we are to pray for our daily bread. The, the point is this. We are to express in prayer our day-to-day -day complete dependence on God. And so with this petition, Jesus is teaching you that it's appropriate for you to bring your needs to him as a way of expressing a dependent and trusting relationship with your father who cares about every last detail of your life. And I submit to you that when you pray for your daily bread, it's not reminding God to give you what you need. It's God reminding you of your need for his provision. And then it's God then showing you his faithfulness as he gives you that daily provision and growing your faith in him so that when bigger things come along, when trials come along, your faith is where it should be. The fourth principle that Jesus gives us a, as a pattern for our prayers then is this. We're to pray for forgiveness. Jesus tells us to pray, verse 4, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now, are there, there are some theological issues we need to consider as we look at this verse. First, Scripture tells us, of course, that, that for the person who has placed his or her faith in Christ alone for salvation, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to that person's account that person's sins are forgiven and his salvation is permanently established, never to be lost. True believers have God's once and for all judicial forgiveness. God has declared the Christian forever forgiven in that positional sense of justification. And as we have seen, Jesus is teaching those who are already true believers how to pray. So this prayer is not a prayer for that forever positional forgiveness that comes when we are justified by grace through faith. This prayer is a prayer regarding the daily walk of the Christian life. As we go through our day-to-day -day life, we sin. In the positional sense of justification, those sins are already wiped away as far as the east is from the west, and they're already forgiven. However, 
from a daily walk in communion with God, Jesus tells us here we are to come to him and confess those sins. As a believer, then, we have his his eternal positional forgiveness. But now as his child, when we sin, we ask for his parental forgiveness. And now not as our judge, but as our father. So we confess our sins, and we ask his forgiveness to clean our conscience, and so that we don't harbor unconfessed sin that would interrupt our communion with him. And 1 John 1 verse 9 assures us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Something else here, related here, anything that would make us comfortable with sin must be eradicated from our lives. And then, that means that not carefully examining your life, denying your sin, or refusing to confess and repent of it, that begins what can become a cycle of thinking lightly of sin, of overlooking what is hideous in God's sight. So Jesus has commanded you here as the fourth principle in this prayer to pray for forgiveness. And you must do this on a consistent basis so that you don't stifle your conscience and somehow become blind or comfortable with sin. And so he's given us this sanctifying gift of confession. And he tells us here This is to be a standard part of our prayer life, a principle of our prayer life. Now look at the second half of verse 4. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. This, of course, is not saying that we somehow merit our own salvation and God's forgiveness by our forgiveness of others. Instead, this, posi- this petition speaks to the biblical doctrine that if you, have, a, if you have, God, have known God's forgiveness, if you are saved, then you have a truly regenerate heart. And forgiveness of others is evidence of that. It's evidence of a regenerate heart. If you're a true believer, then yes, mercy is, And forgiveness of others will characterize your life. That's not to say that that, that a Christian is always perfect in that. But forgiveness is to be the bent of our heart now as true believers. And this matter of our forgiveness of others is so important that Jesus includes it here in, in these principles for prayer as a reminder to us that we need to check ourselves to make sure that we're not harboring unforgiveness. Forgive us of our sins, for we ourselves also forgive. Now understand this. You cannot know the parental forgiveness of your father that keeps your fellowship with him so rich unless you forgive others in your heart. When you refuse to forgive others, God won't forgive you either. And again, I'm not talking about in a permanent justifying sense, but when you refuse to forgive others, God does not forgive you in terms of this parental forgiveness that we're talking about here, and you therefore, thereby forfeit the inner peace and depth of spiritual life that only close communion with the Lord can produce. And you fall into a time of spiritual shallowness and indifference. So before you go to the Father to seek his parental forgiveness, make sure that you have forgiven from your heart the one who has wronged you. The fifth principle that Jesus gives us in this pattern for our prayer life is this. We are to pray for spiritual protection. The end of verse 4. And lead us not into temptation. 
Jesus is telling you that in your prayers, you are also to be proactive in the sense of requesting God's present and future protection from sin. This is a prayer that recognizes that God is, of course, sovereign and he's in providential control of our lives. God does lead us. And so not only is, able, is God able to protect us in the time of temptation, but he's also able to lead us away from the particular temptation entirely. This is a prayer of a wise Christian who desires to grow in righteousness, but who honestly looks at the power of sin and who looks at his own sinful propensities and says, Lord, I realize very well that if I am exposed to temptation, then I might fall, so lead me not into temptation. Okay. So that's the first critical instruction to guide your prayer life that Jesus lays forth for us in this passage. He gives us a pattern for prayer that includes those five principles for prayer. And I realized that was somewhat of a flyover. And if you want to go back to that first message, you'll get more detail there. But Jesus goes on now to very graciously give us the second critical instruction to guide our prayer life. And he spends a lot of time on this as well. Here it is. He instructs us to be persistent in prayer. This is so important. He teaches us this by means of a parable in verses 5 through 8. And so just follow along with me, beginning in verse 5, and I'll read down now through verse 8. Then he said to them, Suppose one of, you has, one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey. And I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. Verse 8, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Let's consider this parable. In the ancient world, people depended on their friends when they needed something, so it's not surprising that this man goes to his friend with this request for some food. What is surprising here is the timing. In those days, people got up early and they went to bed early. So the fact that Jesus said this man came at midnight would have been striking to his disciples. And this man said to his friend, friend, lend me three loaves. And then he goes on to explain to his friend why he needs them. A friend who, of his who, who was on a journey has arrived at his house. We understand that travel was difficult in those days and when a traveler arrived at his destination, you know, he hadn't had the luxury of stopping at six or seven restaurants along the way. He usually arrived very hungry, and the host had the obligation to provide a nice meal. Well, apparently this man didn't know his friend was coming, and so he wasn't prepared. He had no food to give him. There was only one thing to do, go to his friend and make this request. Normally, this man wouldn't have thought of bothering his friend and his family at midnight, but he had a very real need. So this is very bold, right? Now look at verse 7. He gets a somewhat predictable response. The man answers him, answers him from inside, do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children are, are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. But in verse 8, Jesus jumps straight to the point of the parable. He says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. 
The, the implication here is, the, is that the man persisted to make the request of his friend. He did not give up, and eventually his friend gave him all that he needed. Now, I, I want to make a comment on the, on the Greek word that is translated persistence there in verse 8 in many of our English translations, including the New American Standard that I was reading from. It's an interesting word, and it's a little hard to, diff- in, to translate into the English uh, language. Greek lexicons tell us that, that this word has the sense of shamelessness or unembarrassed boldness or importunity. I had to look that word up. It's a word that includes the idea of persistence. Now, think about the man in this parable who comes and asks for loaves of bread. He does not come over to his neighbor's house and sort of weakly knock at the door and weakly whisper, hey, really sorry to bother you. I know it's probably even stupid of me to ask. I know this is a ridiculous request. I'm sure you don't have any loaves that you could lend me, do you? No? Okay, then. Just forget about it. I'll go home and I won't ever bother you again. No. The word that Jesus uses in verse 8 highlights the fact that this man was shameless and very bold to come and wake up his friend and make this request at midnight and that he was very persistent. He wouldn't give up. Jesus is teaching us that we are to be like this in prayer. We are to come boldly to our heavenly father with our prayers. We're to come with confidence that he wants to hear us that he wants to hear our petitions, and he wants to answer our prayers in the very best way. And he does not want tepid, one-and-done prayers, but he wants us to be persistent in our petitions that we bring to him in prayer, continuing to pray about them day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until we get an answer. So the disciple asked Jesus to teach them to pray. He taught them a wonderful pattern for prayer, first of all. And the very next thing he taught them was that they are to confidently and boldly persist in their prayers. Because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, whenever we talk teach through parables, it's important, I think, to mention some truths about parables that apply here as well, and that truth is this. If we press the details of a parable, including this parable, too far, then we end up making serious errors. For example, Jesus is not suggesting that our Heavenly Father gets annoyed when we bother him at any hour of the night. And Jesus is not saying that God is unwilling and must be pressed and coaxed into answering our prayers. And of course, Jesus is certainly not implying that we should never take no for an answer. And that leads us to something else very important that we know from the rest of Scripture. When we pray, we should always submit our request to his perfect will. We pray saying, your will be done. Philip Ryken put it this way, of course God always has the prerogative to say no to our petitions, but when we pray the way that Jesus taught us to pray, according to the pattern and principles of prayer he gave us in verses two through four, we may come to God with the holy boldness of confident faith. Now, Jesus knows our earthly frames and he knows that we can find it hard to pray this way and to keep it up. 
So he added a very encouraging and motivating comment, I believe, in verses 9 through 10. He said, so I, ask, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. Jesus is, is here just further clarifying and repeating and emphasizing his, his instruction about persistence in prayer. The importance of this can't be overstated, so he's driving it home, the, the point home even more in these two verses. Now, some com commentators suggest that there's an in ascending scale of urgency and even aggression in these words, ask, seek, knock. In other words, some suggest that after you ask, if your prayer is not answered, then you try harder in prayer, and if that still doesn't work, then you try even harder and be more urgent in your prayers. They make it kind of sound kind of like asking is step one, seeking is step two in the aggressiveness of your prayers, and then knocking is step three. That's not the point Jesus is making here. What is he saying? Well, the Greek grammar here is very important to understand this. In, in the Greek language, and this is simple to think through, in the Greek language, there are two kinds of ways to express a command. There are aorist imperatives and there are present tense imperatives. Aorist imperatives tell us that he's giving a command for action, but they don't say anything about the repetition of the action. When present imperatives are used though, they refer to an action that is to be a repeated or continuing action. Here's why that's important here, and, it, and here's why that's so revealing here. The commands ask, seek, and knock here in verse 9 are all present tense imperatives. So that means Jesus, and this is very clear, Jesus is commanding you to continue action here. He, he's emphatic and he uses ask, seek, and knock, not in some way to tell you to get more aggressive in your prayers. He's just using them as synonyms to emphasize one thing. You are to ask and keep on asking. You are to seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. He's commanding you to persistence in prayer. He's not calling you to be increasingly aggressive in your prayers or to try harder in your prayers. No, there's, no, there, there's to be a certain sense of urgent desire in your prayers from day one. He's calling you to persistence. Now, just to illustrate this, just as an example, just think about this. Just apply this with me for a minute just to think about this in the area of your own personal growth and holiness. If, for example, you need to grow in mercy or whatever, fill in the blank, then you request God's help. And you request it day after day, week after week, month after month, sometimes year after year. You don't give up, you're to be bold, shameless, persistent. You, re, you sustain your request over time. You keep asking your father for these spiritual blessings, no matter the discouragements and sometimes the very slow or even lack of results along the way. Many fail at this very point. They pray for righteousness. They pray for growth in holiness, growth in Christ-likeness in a certain area of their life in which they're struggling. They pray once or twice or three times or maybe a whole week. But then they stop when they don't get quick results. Do you know that a lack of pers persistence evidences a lack of great desire for the object of your prayer? 
I mean, we can't say, we, we can't even think, but Jesus, I've been at this for a whole week now, and I'm not seeing in, any growth in holiness, so I'm going to stop. If I were to say that to Christ, then I can only imagine he'd be compelled to ask me, how badly do you really want this? How, how badly do you really want to grow in Christ? You, you can't say, I tried asking, but it doesn't work. I still struggle with sin. He didn't help me change. He didn't help me grow in righteousness, so I quit asking. To that, Jesus would say, you are wrong. You never asked me like I told you to ask me. If you stopped praying, then you failed to do what I commanded. You were not persistent. Just think about this in, just in the context even of what Jesus is, it was just teaching back in verses 2 through 4, this pattern for prayer and these principles for prayer. I mean, it's, it, I think it's, we all understand and agree that it's a, an extremely dangerous thing in the Christian life to be content with passing desires for the topics of the disciples' prayer, right? Would you agree with that? It's an extremely dangerous thing in the Christian life to be content with the fleeting, with fleeting passing desires for God's glory and God's kingdom and our daily needs and our forgiveness of sins and his spiritual protection. And our Lord wants, in your life and in my life, not only an urgent desire for those things, but a persistent desire and a persistent watchfulness for those things. And he commands that that desire and that watchfulness be evidenced then in persistent, persevering prayer. Terry Johnson, in his book, When Grace Comes Alive, Living Through the Lord's Prayer, writes this. This is very convicting, but also very helpful. He says, one of the reasons we lack spiritual depth in our day is because of our failure to persist in prayer. Where do we lack it? We lack it in our family life. Our families are not as strong and as spiritually stable as they ought to be. We lack it in our personal lives. We're not progressing in sanctification as we ought. We lack it as a church. We're not seeing revival to any significant degree in our day. We're failing to reach our neighbors in our neighborhoods. Why are those things so? Because we don't pray, and when we do pray, we trifle at it, end quote. Well, but when we are persistent in prayer... What is God's promise to us in verses 9 and 10? Jesus says it very simply, and he repeats it six times. Keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and it will be opened to you. He's linking very clearly persistence in prayer to the efficacy of prayer. In other words, prayer works as you are persistent in prayer. Jesus tells us when we pray this way, God promises to hear and answer us. Now, you know this, this promise, promise is not a blank check that grants us our every wish. Scripture is clear that God does not answer prayers uttered out of selfish greed. James 4, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Now, this, this promise is in the context of the principle, the pattern of prayer and the principles of prayer that Jesus gave us back in these earlier verses. Those principles of prayer are things that align with his will. In 1 John 5, 14 says this, this is the confidence that we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Something else important to understand. Jesus does not in any way 
promise here that our Heavenly Father will answer our every petition in the exact manner that we request or in the exact way we imagine. The, the promise that he makes here is much better than that. His promise is that, his promise that it will be given to you, you will find, it will be open to you, is infinitely better than a promise to give you and I exactly what we request that we think is best. You see, you and I have a problem. We are mere men. And often we pray, we can pray for things with the very best intentions, and we can pray for things that we are convinced are certainly for the best. But oftentimes, though, we are certainly wrong. But we're praying and we're petitioning a God who is all-knowing and all-wise. And that leads us then to the third critical instruction that Jesus gives us in this passage to guide our prayer lives. First instruction, he gives us a, a pattern for prayer with five principles. Second instruction, he instructs us to persist in prayer and now a third instruction. He instructs us by affirming the Father's certain good response to our persistent prayer. We realize this, right? God alone knows how best to answer our prayers. He alone knows what's best for us. He alone knows the events, the sequence of events, and the exact timing of events that will most glorify his name and serve his purposes. We don't. They're beyond our understanding. We can't comprehend them, even after they happen sometimes. And so now our glorious Savior and our gracious Savior, when requested to teach us to pray, he closes this whole section by affirming to us the Father's certain good response to our prayer. Or, or you could say it this way, really the better way to say it, he affirms that the Father will give us the very best response to our prayers. Look at verses 11 and 12. Now suppose one of your fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? Here, Jesus is, is just setting forth the most basic request that a trusting son could make of his earthly father. Father, can you give me a fish or an egg, you know, something to eat? Jesus says, how would the boy's earthly father respond to that request? Would he give him a deadly snake instead of a fish, or would he give him a scorpion instead of an egg? And the obvious answer is absolutely not. The, the, father, the, the earthly father would give his child the good things that he requested. Now look at verse 13. If you then, being evil, stop right there for a moment. Jesus, when Jesus says, if you then being evil, he's not speaking of a, a specific subset of earthly fathers who are especially cruel and wicked. He's speaking of all human fathers in general. And his point is that, is that all fathers are sinners. All human fathers are sinners. And, and, and he says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your fa heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is saying, even though the earthly father is tainted with sin, he still gives good things to the son, to his child. If this is true of lesser fathers, how much more is it true of your greater heavenly father? Now, this is just a kind of a side note, and I, I, don't, I won't take time to elaborate on this, but, but I want you to notice here, Jesus bookends all his instruction on prayer in this section 
with the reality that God is our Father. We saw that back in verse 2, and here it is again. The omnipotent, all-wise Father whose love is everlasting. He is our Father to whom we are to pray. It's such a very important truth for you to treasure in your heart, in your prayer life, and to emphasize that truth. Jesus bookends his, his teaching on prayer. He opens with it in verse 2, and now he closes with it in verse 13. So always remember when you pray that you're praying to your Father, your Heavenly Father. But, but back to verse 13. He's telling you to consider. If sinners give good gifts to their children, how much more will a perfectly holy God give good gifts, the very best gifts to you, his child? In this phrase, this contrasting phrase, how much more is the key to the Lord's point here. How much more, how much more does your heavenly father desire to give you good gifts in your pursuit of matters like those he's commanded you to pray in the disciples' prayer? How much more does he know about exactly what you need in your, in your own pursuit of those things? How much more is he able to give you exactly what you need? This is so wonderful and so gracious. Jesus is asked to teach us to pray. And at the end of his instruction, he very graciously, very graciously assures us, affirms to us that our Heavenly Father's response to our prayers will be the very best response. And, and, and the point of this is Jesus intends for this to be a settled issue in our mind. Now, you probably noticed the surprising twist here at the end of the passage. In the parallel passage in the Sermon on the Mount, in, in, in Matthew 7, Jesus ended slightly differently. There he said, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Here in, in verse 13 of Luke 11, Jesus concludes with this, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, there's more to say about this than time, our time allows, obviously. But in Matthew 7, Jesus spoke of the Father giving what is good. Here in Luke 11, he expanded on that, and, and, he, spoke, and he spoke specifically of the Holy Spirit, who is the best of all gifts that the Father could possibly give us. Now, remember... In the historical context of this passage, this passage in Luke, the Holy Spirit did not yet indwell believers. But yet the disciples here in Luke 11 would have been well, well aware of passages, Old Testament passages like Ezekiel 36 where God had promised, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. So they would have been familiar with this gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and of course, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in believers then becomes reality in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. And now we, as Christians on this side of Acts 2, and with the benefit of more New Testament passages like Romans 8 and John 14 and other passages that teach us more about the Holy Spirit, we understand even more fully the immeasurable blessing of the Holy Spirit. We understand the Holy Spirit as our helper, the paraclete. He's our ultimate helper in our spiritual lives in every way. He continues to illumine the truth of God to us through the teaching of Scripture. He empowers us for evangelism. He intercedes for us. He makes us progressively more like Christ. J.C. Ryle summarize what a great blessing it is when Jesus promises us the Holy Spirit. He says this, the Holy Spirit is beyond doubt the greatest gift which God can bestow upon man. 
having this gift, we have all things, life, light, hope, and heaven. So let me just close with this. Jesus affirms for us here in this section, the Father will respond to our persistent prayers by giving us the very best. And the Holy Spirit encompasses that which is the very best. Lord, teach us to pray. He gives us these three critical instructions. A pattern for prayer that includes five, these five principles for prayer. He calls us to bold and persistent prayer. And he assures us that God, our Father, will answer our prayers with that which is the very best. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the disciple who made this request and for our Lord who taught us these truths here in Luke 11. Father, we pray that you would teach us to pray uh, after the pattern and principles of these prayers, certainly always remembering that the glory, that your glory is even the highest priority of our prayers. Father, we pray that you would teach us to be persistent in prayer. And Father, I pray that you would sear it into our hearts, an understanding that you are our heavenly Father to whom we pray. And that you have affirmed to us that you will answer our persistent prayers with the very best. We ask these things in Christ's name. We're about to sing of our desire for a heart posture that should affect the way that we pray. When we recognize that our worth is not found in anything that can be found in this earthly life, but our greatest treasure is our relationship with our Savior in whom our identity is found. So as you're able, would you stand together? My worth is not in what I own. Oh. Uh-huh.
you'd remain standing just for a few announcements, and that task falls to me this morning. All of them have to do something with Christmas, okay? So we'll wrap it all up in this way. You may have noticed out in the lobby that there are some barrels that are wrapped in Christmas wrapping. Those are for our church family to be able to give some um, non-perishable items to the Winston-Salem Rescue Mission and help them help those in our community in need. And while they also provide these physical needs for them, it is for the purpose of providing opportunities to help share the gospel, which meets their greatest spiritual needs. So I believe over the next couple weeks, we'll be seeking to fill all those barrels. So you can find either in the bulletin or pasted on those barrels the items that are acceptable to put in there. So please um, find opportunities to contribute to that. Number two, our Christmas concerts are coming, and I do want to make you aware, Lord willing, we'll correct it by next week. In the blurb in the bulletin, that's what the fancy word we use for all the words we use, um, the, the times are correct, but in the graphic that's above it, they are incorrect, and that's on me because I gave that to Pam to put in. But Friday night's concert, December 15th, is 7 p.m., so Friday night is the later one. And then Sunday night on the 17th, that one starts at 6 p.m. Again, we'll make more announcements about that, but just watch that on the graphic. Lastly, Donna Whitman has asked for me to recruit any able body people. They, she needs help getting some tubs of Christmas decorations for decorating this week um, out of some closets upstairs. I don't know if Donna's in the service right now, but I'm sure she will be available. Find her. She'll let you know what needs to be brought down, where it needs to go. And so if you're around and able to help Donna right after this service, she would appreciate that as well. Thank you again. If you're a guest with us, we are delighted to have you with us. One of our elders will likely be at one of the small tables out, back, out right outside the lobby. We have a gift for you, a resource we'd like to give you. Um, and so we're grateful to have you here worshiping with us this morning. You are dismissed.